at the silos. All right, so this morning, I'm gonna start out by asking a question. Has anybody heard what I preached on three weeks ago? I got a $20 bill for anybody that remembers what I preached on besides Aaron two weeks ago, three weeks ago. $20. He only knows because I told him this morning. Disciples, yeah. She's a winner. Yes. You can give that back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Put that aside and play this. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, we started a discussion on discipleship. My goal was to talk to you about how to disciple. And God kind of changed it around a little bit to help you understand what a disciple is, what different levels of discipleship are, and then we can talk about how to disciple. So I made it through that first piece of what a disciple is. Then God threw us a little curveball. We didn't have church one Sunday. And then Mandy had a word to give about being on fire. And that on fire word kind of plays into this thing. So I'm going to recap a little bit about what we talked about a couple weeks ago. And I'm going to try to make this quick. We first started by looking at the definition of what a disciple is. A disciple is one who accepts and assists in spreading the beliefs or teaching of another. So someone who accepts what someone is saying, what someone's belief is, and they assist in teaching it and spreading it. So that means there could be good disciples, there could be bad disciples, right? We look at four separate scriptures. There's many out there, but we picked four. We looked at Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Jesus said, go, therefore, go and make disciples. So he's given us a commandment, go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I've given you. We looked at Luke 9.23. Jesus said, and then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. So he said, go teach. But then this is a scripture that talks a little bit about following. John 8.31-32, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. So he's getting a little deeper as we go into these. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you for free. Matthew 4, 19 through 20, Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. So let's go back over. That first scripture, Jesus says, it's our responsibility to what? Make disciples. He literally meant it's our responsibility to teach and instruct the people that we're around how to follow his instructions, his commands. So what we're learning from this is to be a disciple of Jesus, it's a little deeper than just being a follower, or I'm sorry, than just being a believer. To be a disciple or a follower is a little deeper than just being a believer. According to this scripture, you've got to follow what he says to do. The second scripture, he says to be a follower, you've got to start giving up a few things and you have to do a little bit of work. It's easy to believe, not for some, but for some it's easy to believe. Not quite as easy to start giving up stuff, do a little work. He says, give up your selfishness, give up your desires. Take up your cross daily. It means you got to do something and follow him. There's, there's action here. Third scripture, he says, you got to remain faithful to what I teach. That means you got to do what I say. Okay? You getting the theme here? Fourth scripture, he says, I'll teach you how to disciple people, fish for people. I'll teach you how to disciple people. But i got to get you to leave some things you're familiar with behind. For the disciples, it was their life. And we talked about some things that we have a hard time leaving behind. Okay? For us, it may mean leaving some fears, some doubts. I'm not good enough to disciple. I don't know enough. Um, we went through a whole laundry list of things. And I think we agreed during that time that I stepped on everyone's toes in here. And we talked about our Bible culture, the Bible culture that we grew up in, that we live in here. It's kind of built around believe in Jesus and then follow a pastor. Believe in Jesus, follow a church. Believe in Jesus, follow a denomination. You know, I had a guy come in here Friday night for a wedding rehearsal, and he heard our worship team in here practicing. The worship team had to come together Friday to practice so Andy wouldn't, you know, blow stitches out or whatever happened when she had her wisdom removed. <laughs> if you weren't here earlier, you don't get that joke, sorry. When she had her wisdom teeth removed. Um, so they were practicing Friday while the people were eating for the rehearsal. And a guy comes up to me and he goes, so what are they doing in there? I said, that's our praise and worship band. We have church here on Sunday. And he said, what's your denomination? And I said, we teach people about Jesus. 
What's your denomination? We teach people about Jesus. We teach him to follow what Jesus said to do. And I said, this week I'm going to talk about that. And I start telling him. And he's like, well, I grew up Southern Baptist. And uh, I was going to be a Southern Baptist pastor. Now I'm a United Methodist pastor. I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm like, well, that's going to attract people to love Jesus. <laughs> I didn't say that part. <laughs> I was like, good for you, buddy. My point is, unfortunately, we grow up thinking to be a Christian, we just got to believe, and then we follow what someone tells us to do, and that someone's not always Jesus. We talked about this is a continuing effort. Look at Peter. Some people call Peter Jesus' best friend. Jesus says, who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. You're our Savior. Jesus says, you're going to be the rock that I built a church on. He changed his name from Simon to Peter. Then Jesus says, i got to die. And Peter says, no, you're not going to die. And Jesus calls him Satan. So he went from, you're the rock the church is going to be built on to, you're Satan, in six verses. What does that show us? Even the man that walked with Jesus had to make a continual effort. A continual effort every day. Jesus said, you've got to pick up your cross daily. Some of us pick it up week, you know, once a week, once a month. When things are rough, but Jesus said you got to pick it up daily. So now, that's kind of a quick recap of what we talked about three weeks ago. I want to transition to what are the different levels of discipleship. So about six and a half years ago, I left my career. I had no idea what I was going to do. And I was introduced to a man in Chattanooga. And his whole ministry and his whole life was devoted to men's discipleship. And he laid out four levels of discipleship that have stuck with me. So I'm going to, I'm going to give him credit. He said there's four types of Christians. I'm going to do my best to back up at least three of these four with Scripture. Number one is the come and see crowd. So we look at the Bible. Jesus is walking around healing people, doing miracles, casting out demons, producing bread and fish. And people came to see what's going on. I want to see what this is. This is exciting. This is new. We're getting oppressed by the Romans. We're getting beat up. We're getting taxed to death. And we got this guy doing really cool things. Let me come and see what it's about. What's in it for me? Jesus fed 5,000. That was 5,000 men. We don't know how many women and children were there. So arguably 15,000, 20,000 people were the come and see crowd that came. What do I get out of this man that's teaching? Oh, I got some free bread and some free fish. That's pretty cool. I got some free wine at a wedding. I got let go of leprosy that would get me cast out of my community. I got a demon cast out of me that made me, made me throw myself in a fire. In other words, these people were the come and see. I've heard you do this. What can you do for me? You see a little selfishness there? The second level is a subset of the come and see crowd actually believed in who he was. It was different to come and see and expect something free from him. It's a little different when you got to go, oh, I'm going to actually believe you're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You die, you're going to die for me or you did die for me. However you want to put it in their terms or our terms. So a subset of the come and see crowd actually believed. They knew scripture and they knew he fulfilled a prophecy or all the prophecies. And then a subset of the believed crowd actually followed. They actually gave up some stuff. They gave up their comforts, their traditions, their past beliefs. They got persecuted. you got to be able to pass the come and see crowd and the just believe crowd to be willing to give up your life. And then a subset of the follow me crowd actually abides in Jesus every day. So you come and see what's in it for me. Okay, this is good enough. I'll believe it. I'm going to actually make a decision to follow. I'm going to make every decision every day based on what I think Jesus would ask me to do. How does this compare to our church today? Our church? Any other church? You ever seen come and see churches? You ever been in a church that puts more emphasis on what the light show looks like? And what people think about music? Than what the preacher preaches about? I don't want to go to church there anymore because their worship's not good. Or flip side of that, I love this church because, man, I can just jam out. It's good worship. And this just appeals to me. What do you say? What's in it for me? What am I getting out of coming to church every Sunday? Unfortunately, almost every new modern church that I see pop up, almost 
or this church? What about belief? Well, let's teach a message that's soft and warming and welcoming. It gives hope and it makes you feel good. So you'll have something you want to believe in. Now we've got a bunch of people that quickly raise their hand and say they believe, but they're not walking it out there. They don't understand that sometimes you've got to get out of your comfort zone. Sometimes you've got to be willing to get your toes stepped on a little bit, to use that term. They don't understand they've got to give up some things, and it's going to be a little uncomfortable. I'm not so sure that come and see church and believe church are that far apart because it's let's do something attractive to bring them in. Make sure we got good coffee and good donuts and uh, no offense because there were two angels that showed up with donuts this morning so y'all keep doing that. <laughs> I promise I had this example before they showed up with donuts. Let's make it comfortable. Let's get good padded seats. Sorry, we don't have good padded seats. <laughs> Let's make sure the worship's not too loud, but it's enough of a rock concert to entertain and keep people interested and make them raise their hands because it feels like the Holy Spirit. Because I got chill bumps. I get chill bumps when Tennessee runs through the tea. I don't think that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Maybe sometimes. That's another discussion another day. And let's give a message soft enough that they will want to believe. And that's what we're all about. Because if we can just get them to believe, that's a soul in heaven. Okay? Why are these churches so popular? Because previous to that, we had a history of churches that were controlling. Had an agenda. Not so much wanted us to learn, because if we learn, then we're not as dependent on them and they lose control. People got sick of that, so they want to go to the newer model. Soft, loving. Here's the problem. It produces shallow Christians. If you are coming for what you get out of church, that's not good. Do I want to learn? Do I get something out of preparing this message? Absolutely, but why am I doing it? So I can follow and give and disciple and teach. And that's the attitude we should all have when we walk in here. We don't walk in here to see how much the worship appeals to us. We walk in here to see how much we can praise our God. We don't walk in here to just believe. We walk in here to learn how to follow and get to this abiding stage. I think as a church, it's our responsibility. And this is all you guys, not just me and Wendy. This is all of us. It's our responsibility to teach the truth about God's Word, the complete truth. The complete truth lays out things like love, compassion, acceptance. The soft things. The things that feel good. You know, I got a past. I needed that love and compassion. I needed to meet Wendy in like 15, 17 years ago. We just celebrated 15 years of wedding this past Thursday. So, 16. I needed her because I was in a really bad spot in my life and I needed someone to show me love, compassion, and acceptance to get me to the next stage. But 15 years later, I don't need to be in the same stage of just looking for the good things of what I get out of it. Because the Bible also talks about things like lukewarm. See, here's what's funny. I already had this second piece of this message prepared when Mandy came to me the weeks between our message, the messages and said, I've got something I need to tell the church. And what was her sermon on? Not being lukewarm, but being on fire. See, the Bible talks about some hard things like lukewarm, it talks about thinking you know Jesus when you don't. It talks about being persecuted, that we should expect it. So there's some good soft things and there's some tough things too. And we've got to take both and we've got to teach both. So who knows who can recite to me John 3.16? McCall. You should have known I was going to put you on the spot. Yeah, say it. John 3.16. So who, who, everybody knows John 3.16, right? Or some version of it. God loves me so much. He said, Jesus is not for me, and I get to go to heaven. Who knows Revelation 3.16? Anybody know that one? I just read it. I just read it. I can't just have it to you, but I have it on my phone. Okay. Revelation 
But since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to read it again. But since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's the words of Jesus Christ. Those are red letters. What's my point? It's easy for me to walk around reciting John 3.16. It's not easy for me to live out Revelation 3.16. Okay? Now here's something important. John 3.16 says, God sent his son so that you, 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 you can turn alive. Revelation 3.16, Jesus is talking to a whole church. This is when Jesus comes back and he addresses seven churches and he tells them what's wrong with them. And nobody wants to teach out Revelations because it's really tough. It's hard to understand and I'm right there with them. But he is talking to a church and he says, I'm spitting you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. It's a whole church and in person. We can all recite John 3.16, but maybe we need to be able to remember Revelations 3.16 in our mind. Later, in verse 19 of Revelation 3, he says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So we look at discipline as such a bad thing. But he disciplines us and corrects us because he loves us. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Do you see what's going on here? Jesus is saying, I don't want to spit you out of my mouth. I want you to be in eternity with me. That's why I died for you. But i got to get you to do some things. you got to be a little better than lukewarm. You need to be hot. Hot or cold. There's no, what is it you say? There's no gray air. There's no gray air. And some of us live in the gray area all the time. Me included. See, one day, I'm going to stand accountable in front of that son that died in John 3.16. And I'm going to have to give an account for what I teach you. And I'm going to be honest with you. That's not a fun thing to think about. <laughs> I want to stand in front of him. That's fun to think about. But when he goes, why did you say this? And that's not what it meant. That's not going to be fun, right? So I want you to know I take this seriously. And I don't want to be lukewarm. And I don't want any of you to be lukewarm. And this isn't a religious hammer you over the head with a Bible statement. This is, I want you to stand in front of Jesus and him not spit us as a church out of his mouth. Does that make sense? That's why we're preaching. That's why we're willing to step on toes. We're going to go deeper into God's Word. And I'm going to ask you to make changes in your life. And if that bothers you, if it takes you so far out of your comfort zone that you can't take it, I'm sorry. This may not be the right church. And I'm okay with that. If you want to get loved in the deepest, darkest moments of your life by someone who understands your pain because he's lived it or she's lived it, you're at the right church. If you want to be challenged with Scripture to make changes in your life that will bring you peace and joy and life, and they're the same changes we're making in our lives every day and we're challenging ourselves with, you're at the right church. If you want to be taught by someone that screws up every day, is trying to figure out what following and abiding means, you're at the right church. If you want to be comfortable with the rock band and the light show, if that's easy to swallow messages and make you feel good about your sin, standing behind slogans like Jesus' blood covers all, you're at the wrong place. Because Jesus' blood does cover all. But we can't take that part and leave out the other parts where he says, yeah, I know you sin, but go sin no more. Stop sinning. He walks up to someone and he can read her mail about what her sin is. That she's sleeping around with all these men. And he doesn't condemn her. He just simply says, I'm going to forgive you. You go sin no more. So we can't have this Jesus covers all of our sin, but leave out these things like quit sinning or repent, turn from your sin. And we can't turn away from the things like it's our responsibility, each of you, to teach someone to disciple someone. I can go on and on. Now I want to be clear. We're not asking you guys to be perfect. I'm asking you not to be lukewarm. There's a difference. Say, I'm going to make fail. I'm going to fail. I sat up here last week and openly admitted to God in front of every one of you that I had failed. And that broke me. And it changed the way I talked to people this week. 
See, I'm not asking you to be perfect because I'm not perfect. That'd be sort of hypocritical. I'm asking you to be on fire for Jesus. I'm not talking about cartwheels down the aisle. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about being willing to talk to someone about Jesus. When someone asks you, what's your denomination? Where do you go to church? Well, something simple like, we talk about Jesus. We try to follow Jesus. We learn about Jesus. We praise Jesus. Someone's going to say the word Jesus if we're outside of this, this church. I'm just asking you to be teachable, to be accepting of the messages, to accept the challenges, to try. We'll sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one. We'll help you through where you're stuck. That's what discipling is all about. I'm trying. It's not working. I failed. That's okay. See, Jesus had that with the disciples. Remember, the disciples went out, and they said, we're trying to heal, and we're doing it in your name, but it ain't working. And Jesus says, because you don't believe. Oh, okay. <laughs> he taught them. And he sent them back out. He didn't chastise them, get on to them, tell them to go back to everybody they failed with. He sent them out with a new teaching. He helped them understand what they weren't doing. And we want to do that for you. We'll help you where you're stuck. We'll guide you with scripture, with what Jesus says. Anybody that's ever been in counseling with me, what do I do? Is it out of my head? Or does it come from scripture? Every ounce of it, as far as I can remember, comes out of scripture. We're going to teach you what Jesus said. Being on fire doesn't mean just judgmental or harsh. I think we, I think we get that misconception that if I'm going to be on fire, it means I'm going to go out and preach on the street corner and yell at people and tell them they're going to hell. That's not what being on fire means. It means being ready to teach when you have an opportunity. It means being ready to share when you have an opportunity to tell someone about what Jesus has done for you. Jesus loves you so much he died for you, and he expects you to be on fire for him. He's going to discipline you because he loves you. And he expects you to do what he says. And that includes making disciples. So I got a little tied up there in the uh, believe part. <laughs> Let me go on to the follow part. It's easy to believe. It's hard to follow. The difference between a believer and a follower is a follower has to start giving up some things. We talked about this before. We got to start giving up some things. We got to start doing what Jesus said. It's not enough to post it on Facebook. It's not enough to tell people the good slogan. It's not enough to wear a what would Jesus do bracelet. We've got to start actually doing some of the things that he says give up. The cool thing is we've got a handbook that has all kinds of instructions in it. It's called a Bible. So if we're going to be something other than lukewarm or cold, we might need to read it. So we know what we got to give up. So we know the instructions. So we know what to follow. So I'm challenging you. Don't wait on me to give you scripture. Don't wait on Winnie to give you scripture. Go dig into it yourself. You don't know where to start? Based on this sermon, go to anything that's got red letters. Anything. It's easy. You just read what he says to do. The people Jesus talked to tried to overcomplicate everything he said so he kept to them in stories and parables. I mean, he explained what the parables meant. He gave it to us in a way that it's easy to believe. We've just gotten convinced by, the, by Satan that it's, that it's too hard for us to understand it. We need someone with an education or a doctor in front of their name to tell us about it. Jesus didn't go choose doctors. Luke was a doctor, but other than that, he chose a bunch of fishermen. Right? problem, I think, is that some of us think we follow him when we don't, and we just believe. Because you say you follow him doesn't really mean you follow him. So there's three examples I can think of off the top of my head in the Bible. A man comes up to Jesus and says, I want to follow you. I like what you're doing. I want to follow you. I'm going to give it to you in layman's terms. I like what you're doing, man. This is cool. I want to follow you. You're the new cool guy in town. And Jesus says, no, you don't. I'm homeless. Foxes have a den. Birds have a nest. I don't have a place to lay my head. I'm homeless. That's what he said. I'm homeless. I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. You don't want to follow me. And the guy walked off. Does it say Jesus chased him? Does it say he came back? No. Jesus knew he was willing to be the come and see, maybe even believe, but he wasn't going to follow him, so he didn't waste his time. So there's going to be some people in your life that Satan may put in your way that don't want to follow 
And this is tough, I know, but there are going to be some people you may have to give them some challenges to follow, and if they don't, let them go. Because all they'll do is block you from all those other people that were supposed to follow Jesus, if Jesus would have wasted time on him. Second example. God comes up to Jesus and says, I want to follow you, but I got to go bury my parents. I'll be back. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Man, that sounds harsh. But in their culture, death and burial took one year. So what's the guy really saying? I'm going to get around to following you, but I, 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 I'll get to you in a year. That doesn't sound like I'm fire. That sounds like I'll get to it when I can. How many of us have that attitude? I'm going to be honest with you, I used to have that attitude about tithing. <laughs> when I get a better job, when I can pay my bills, then I'll tithe. That's the biggest example I could think of for me, for waiting. But when I started tithing, I started getting blessed. My heart changed about the money. I didn't need as much money. I started giving more. I felt more blessed, and it kind of worked in the opposite effect. Uh, I just need a better job and less bills and more money to give. But see, for each of us, there's something different. Some of us are givers. That's not a big deal. But some of you have something else that you want to lay down in a year or two when you get to it. Jesus kind of turned that away. And you know what? I forgot my third example, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> What's the third one? There's the third one. No. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Rich man. Thanks. If I had another 20, I'd give you another 20. <laughs> Rich man comes up. To Jesus says, I want to follow you. What do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus says, give up everything you own. He didn't tell all of us to give up everything we own. He just knew that man's heart was around his possessions, his belongings, to give up everything you own. The guy walks away. That's three examples of where Jesus didn't disciple because they weren't ready and their hearts weren't right. So what I'm trying to tell you there is not everybody's willing to be a follower. Some people just want to be believers and they're stuck there and that's where they're going to be. Try, challenge, work with them. But maybe you need to move on at some point if they're not willing. So there's kind of two parts there. I'm asking you to be a follower, and I'm asking you to seek out someone who wants to be a follower to disciple them. So again, we got a handbook, but if the handbook never gets opened or read or studied, it's kind of hard to know what to do to follow. A believer will show up on Sunday and listen to what I say or another pastor says or what a pastor says online. I believe a follower will go home and read and study the scripture to learn for themselves. When I do marriage counseling or premarital counseling, I don't teach them what the Bible says about marriage. I challenge them to come to their session ready to teach me. Why is that? Because if they can't spend five minutes looking at scripture, looking at how to Google scripture on marriage, how are they ever going to make an effort in their marriage? Plus, if they're not willing to dig into those scriptures, when you dig into the scripture to teach it, you learn it. You learn it a whole lot better than what I say. So I'm challenging you hard to get in your Bible. I don't care if it's on your device, paper, Bible, I don't care. Just get in the Bible and read. You don't know where to start, start Matthew. Okay? What's in the Bible? 1 John 2, 5 through 6. But those who obey God's word truly show how they completely, how completely they love Him. This is how we know we are living in Him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So I think there's a fine line between following and abiding. And honestly, I think there's very kind of ebb and flow between. And I think Paul shows us a model of his own life where he goes from non-believer, he's not even come and see, he goes from non-believer to, oh no, I can't see, <laughs> I'm now a believer, Follower, and he lives out his whole walk of writing his letters, becoming more of an abider. So maybe the difference between a follower and a abider is just maturation of, of you as a Christian. If you read Paul, Paul's letters aren't chronological order, by the way. If you read them in chronological order, you see a man in the beginning that is just what's the word? He's he's on fire. He's um, he's zealous. He's going out, he's teaching everybody, and then you go to his last letter, and he's a humble man. You can see the humility, the, the, how, the maturation of Paul, how he gains humility if you read his letters in chronological order. And I think that's all Jesus is asking us to do. If you follow him with everything you got, you will get to the abiding stage. You'll get to the point where every morning 
you wake up and something hits you. Oh, the IRS called. We owe them a lot of money. This happened in April of this year. And the first thing I said was, thank you, God. Something had to happen good for me to have to owe them money, so thank you, God. You had to give me investments 10 years ago that I had to cash in early that I'm getting penalties on right now to have this problem. Thank you, God. Took the pressure off. Fast forward to October, still had to pay it. But it was a fraction of what I originally had to pay because God did some miracles and re-swizzling some things with the CPA. Still had to pay it. But that was the best check I ever wrote for that amount because it was less than half of the original amount. I thank God again. There's a difference between following and, oh my gosh, I'm gonna, I don't know how I'm going to pay this and just saying, I'm going to surrender to you, God. I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm going to keep putting one foot in front of the other and your word tells me you're not going to let me down. I'm going to trust you. I didn't just give up and go off into a cave and say, God, make money grow on a tree. I kept working and kept going and kept following. Honestly, there's been times this year when it would have been easy to say, I'm tired of doing the wedding stuff. I'm tired. Of, it's, it's too much business crap. I'm not tired of doing the church. I love the church, but I'm tired of doing the wedding stuff. We can't, we can't exist without it. And I thank God. He just kept putting one foot in front of the other and he took care of everything. So what I'm saying is following Jesus is doing what he says to do. Abiding is trying to make every decision and let every thought come through a filter as if he's right there with you helping you make the decision. What would you do right now, Jesus? Not a bracelet. What would you do? What would you do, Jesus? What would your word say to do? Your word would say, I should have joy through perseverance. I'm persevering right now, so I have, I'll have joy. I'll choose that, Jesus. See, knowing what to do comes from reading the book. I'm actually praying a little bit. So I don't know where each of you are today. Some of you may be in the come and see phase. Some of you may have came because you got drug here by a parent. Or a spouse or whoever. Um, some of you may be believers. Some of you may be followers. Some of you may be abiders. I don't really care where you are. I want to encourage you to challenge yourself of where I am and figure out what do I need to do to get to the next step. If I came in here as a come and see, what is this thing that I want to believe? If I came in here as a believer, what do I do to follow? If I came in here as a follower, what do I do to abide? How do we get to the next step? If you follow or abide and you want to make that commitment, I want you to follow the command in Matthew 28 where he says make disciples. So this started out with a whole sermon on how I was going to talk about how to disciple and then it ends up being a very small subset at the end of the second sermon. Jesus said teach people so they will follow. Teach people so they will follow. Teach people so they will follow. He didn't say teach people so they believe. That's a key difference. He said teach people so they will follow. Teach people so they will follow. If you don't think you know enough, Satan's winning the battle. But I'm going to give you a simple equation that was taught to me six and a half years ago for discipling. If you know one more thing than the person next to you, you can disciple them. That's a huge difference than I don't know enough. If I know one more thing, I can disciple them. If I know one more thing than Chris, I can disciple them. If Chris knows one more thing than Henry, he can disciple them. If Henry knows one more thing than John, he can disciple them. If John knows one more thing than Barry, worked it in there. <laughs> he can disciple. Sorry, it's a side joke. It's a simple equation. If I know one more thing than someone else, I can disciple them. Quit overthinking it. Do it. So I want to give a couple of examples of discipleship because I think examples of the way Jesus taught us, the way I want to teach. Last week, there was a young person in this church that was challenged by the message. That person had the courage to reach out to the person that gave the message. Mm -hmm. I want to step back a little bit. Wendy and Bonnie, I don't know, six, seven years ago, started discipling Mandy. Mandy started discipling a young girl named Wiki that came up here last week and gave testimony. When Mandy talked to this young lady, Mandy assigned Wiki to go disciple her. That's four generations of discipleship. That's the model. It's that simple. That discipleship started this week. That's the model. That's perfect. There's no other better model. There's no spreadsheet we can keep up with. That's Jesus showing up 
and people discipling. And do you think any of those people were out of their comfort zone? Probably all four of them at some point. It's four generations of discipleship that have happened in, what, six, seven years? I want to brag on Andy. Andy has an incredible voice. Andy has a gift for worship. We have God's bless us with an incredible team. And I've heard her say over and over and over, my first responsibility is to disciple, not sing. So she gives Peyton an opportunity to play the guitar. She gives Haven an opportunity to sing. She gives little Lauren Daigle an opportunity to get up and sing and Karis and all the other ones. That's disciple. She's teaching them something she knows and telling them it's okay. Little man gets up here and preaches a couple of Sundays ago. You think they didn't challenge him? Children are going to do the announcements. That's discipleship. That's a model of discipleship. And I want to challenge parents this morning. If you have children, I'm going to go ch grand ch parents or grandparents. If you have children or grandchildren you're responsible for, your number one job is to disciple them first. But see, that's back to the old church model. Let me show up, drop them off at church, and let them disciple. Drop them off at school, let them teach them. Drop them off at church, let them disciple. It's our responsibility. I have a 14 year old and a 9 year old. I have to disciple first and foremost. Many of you were blessed with children and grandchildren in this church. It's your responsibility to disciple your child. If you don't know what to tell them, ask someone who's discipling you. No one's discipling me. Find someone to disciple you. If you're not getting discipled, find someone to disciple you. If you're not discipling someone, find somebody to disciple you. What's discipleship look like for me? It looks like meeting for coffee. It looks like meeting here at the bar and saying, hey, how's it going, man? It doesn't look like, okay, today I prepared to teach you out of 2 Timothy 2. <laughs> We're on chapter 4 of our discipleship book. How did you do this week? I couldn't understand any of the questions. That's because you don't know enough. Let me teach you. And in a year, you'll know how to teach someone else. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is, I'm at a crappy week, and I want to throw my marriage in the trash. What do I do? Well, first of all, let's pray, man. I don't know what to tell you to do. I know I can pray. Maybe God can do something. That's discipleship. We've got to quit overthinking it. Okay? <laughs> so Paul gives us a pretty simple blueprint too. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. I'm going to teach out of that. You have heard me teach things. He's talking to Timothy. You've heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many witnesses. So he's saying, Timothy, you've heard me say things that you know are true. It's not garbage. You know it's true because it's been confirmed. Now go teach them to other tr trustworthy people so they can pass them on. It's a simple model. You've heard me teach things. You know it's true, so you've got to make sure it's true. Now you go teach. But find trustworthy people so they can go teach too. I'm going to brag on Aaron. I've had the opportunity to work with Aaron for, I don't know, going on a year now. I could sit down in one time of meeting with him when he was struggling and tell him something. And within a week, I'll be dang if I didn't hear him telling someone else. Has he been perfect? No. Have I been perfect? No. But guess what? He's listening and applying and teaching others. That's discipleship. I'm going to end with a statement I saw on Facebook this week. It said, we're not called to merely fill the church with members. We're called to fill the earth with disciples. Jesus didn't say fill the church. He said make disciples.